back and look at the videos online at various places. So at this point in my ministry as a pastor, I think I have done more weddings than funerals. I think I've done more weddings than fu funerals. Now I imagine as time goes on, I'll probably end up doing more funerals than weddings. Because the, the truth is that not everyone has a wedding, but everyone is going to have a funeral. Now, the raw facts of that reality makes us wonder about what is next. It is the age-old question that has been asked for generations and by all humanity, what happens after we die? And as you know, there's a variety of opinions where some people think we are just annihilated and that's the end. Others think that perhaps we are reincarnated and we come back in a different form. Others think that, that we are going to be uh, uh, damned to hell and others think that there's going to be new life. And so of all of these thoughts and opinions and things that are out there, the question is, what is true? And to answer that question, we have to ask, well, who can we trust? And that's the question that we are asking today. I don't know about you, but I'm choosing to believe Jesus because of who he is. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Jesus, okay? Jesus, in Scripture, was anticipated by the ancients. Even from the opening pages of Genesis, there was this rumor, there was this echo that there indeed will be a Redeemer who will come. And the prophets, in the length of time, proclaimed that this Messiah, this Holy One, will show up. And when the time was right, the angels announced that this son was born. And a holy, heavenly choir, as this tiny baby came on this planet, God in the flesh, in a lowly manger. Now, this person named Jesus grew up. We see him in scripture, and he was about 12 years old, and he was interacting, and he told his parents, I am and should be and desire to be in my father's house. Now again, we see him as he started his ministry when he was around 30 years old or so. And he was baptized in the Jordan River, and at that time, heaven's opened and the Holy Spirit came down upon him and there was a voice from heaven that this said that this is my dearly beloved son. Listen to him. And he was sent into the desert and he was tempted but he never gave in. Lived a perfect sinless life. He proclaimed the kingdom of God to the people near and to the people far. And as he went, he called people to himself. He said, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. He went into small villages and proclaimed the kingdom. And there he opened blind eyes. In other places, he uh, multiplied food from one little lunch to feed thousands. He stilled the storms as they were going across this big lake or the Sea of Galilee. He walked on water. He encountered people who were um, plagued and demonized, and he freed these people. He healed the places that he went, again, proclaiming the kingdom of God. And then, during his final week, he told his disciples three times that he was going to go to Jerusalem, that he would indeed be crucified and then rise again. And Jesus did that very thing. This is the one who healed the sick. This is the one who proclaimed the kingdom. This is the one who was free from sin. This is the one who died in my place. This is the one who rose again. This is the one who was proclaimed among the nations. And if I'm going to believe anyone, I'm going to believe him, right? 
This is Jesus of Nazareth. And what he says about what will happen after we die, believe him. More so than any religious figure, more so than any scientific study, more so than anyone else who claims to know what happens, Jesus knows. And you and I can trust him. And in him is the hope of the world. This is Christ who we proclaim today. This is what we observe this day in which we say he has risen. So today in our celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are going to talk about the hope we have because of who Christ is and what he has done so that we can be encouraged about what is to come and strengthened in our faith. Today I want you to leave knowing the sure confidence of what Christ did, what he said, and what we can anticipate for the future. So that when we get close to the time in which we are going to move to the other side, we can rest assured in what God has done for us. So Paul, in his letter, who was a prophet, who was an apostle, wrote letters to the church. In one of his letters to a church in a town or a city called Corinth, he wrote what we're going to look at today. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and open up to 1 Corinthians, and of course we're going to chapter 15. Now chapter 15, Paul details the important aspects of the resurrection, what took place, why it matters, and what we are to remember because of what happened and what Christ has done. So we are going to pick it up in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're going to look at just the last verses of this chapter, starting in verse 50. So this is where we're going to start, and because of the resurrection, we're going to look at a few things that need to be impacted into our heart and focused in on our mind. So here is the first point. Because of the resurrection, you will be changed. That's a good amen spot, right? Because of the resurrection, you and I will be changed. Change. And I can say that emphatically. So here we go. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting with verse 50. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you, mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet, it will sound, <laughs> the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. That's good news, right? It's good news as these perishable, decaying, corrupted bodies fail us and fall. These bodies of ours will not make it to heaven in their present form, regardless of how good looking you think you are or how strong you think you are. <laughs> Come on. This won't make it to the other side, for we have been corrupted. You and I, no one can gain heaven by our own merit. You and I and every person on this planet has been corrupted by the power 
and penalty of our choices to disobey and rebel against our Creator. We have been, because of our choice, turned over to our corruption. And we cannot and we will not inherit the perfect and imperishable kingdom of God. For we are mortal. And the kingdom is immortal. We are imperfect. And the kingdom is perfect. We are corruptible. And the kingdom is incorruptible. But here's the truth. And Paul lays it out for us. Not everyone, and I like this term, will sleep. He's talking about not everyone when Christ's return is going to be dead. There will be some still alive. But he uses the word sleep for death. You know why I like the word sleep? Because if you're sleeping, you will wake up. Right? And there's going to be an alarm clock that sounds that no one will sleep through. Right? When the trumpet, the last trumpet of God is sounded, everyone who is sleeping will get up that day. No one will miss that sound when he declares with a loud voice that he is here in his glory and it will be announced throughout all of creation and everyone who is asleep in that moment will raise in that moment will be changed in that moment will rise Again, that is a powerful day. This is, that is the great getting up morning. Now, I've done a few funerals, a number of them, actually quite a few. And often, in particular, when people are military, they'll play a song. You know the song? It's called Taps, right? Beautiful profound moments. And I've been there with a, with a um, slight snow falling in silence as these notes are rung. Now you may be buried with the sound of one trumpet, but you will rise again with the sound of another. Winston Churchill, who was a famous British Prime Minister, knowing that he was to die, planned his own funeral service. I like this guy. By the way, I've been planning my own funeral service. I already have. I'm not kidding you. <laughs> he planned his own service, and he told the pastor, this is what I want done. And so at the end of the ceremony, they're in St. Peter's Cathedral, there in, well, I wasn't in Rome. St. <laughs> Peter's Cathedral, where was he? At St. Paul's Cathedral, okay. Up in the rafters, they played, of course, taps. At the end of taps being played, everyone thought the service was done. And there was a long, dramatic pause where one trumpet sounded the end of the day. He had reveille play. Come on, Winston. Come on, brother. 
He knew that at one trumpet we are laid down, but at another we will rise again. This is what the Word incarnate proclaimed to us. This is what the Holy Spirit declares to us. This is the mystery that God tells us that at the last trumpet we will be changed. Now, it might be weird to you, but I often go to cemeteries. And I go there because, one, they're beautiful. Number two, they're profound. And they remind me that in just a little while, I'll be in a place like this. And I go around and I look at headstones and I read various sayings and I wonder about their lives. And I reflect upon what I would want on my headstone. And I think this might be the thing that I'll pick. It might be this. Let me show this slide. Waiting for the last trumpet. Waiting for the last trumpet. Why are we waiting for this trumpet? Because Jesus promised it will happen. And I believe Jesus. I believe the God-man. I believe the Word incarnate. I believe this holy and righteous one. When he says it will happen, it will happen. The trumpet will sound. The dead will be raised imperishable. And that we will be changed. This is the guarantee of God himself. And he gives it to us. And he will do it. And in the promise, we have been set free from fear and death to become captives as prisoners of hope. Remember this from last week? Two weeks ago, prisoners of hope. Because of the resurrection, you will be changed. Secondly, we read, because of the resurrection, death will be defeated. Don't you like that? Death will be defeated. Let's continue to read, picking this up with verse 54. Now, when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Now, death does have a sting to it. I remember when I was a young man around seven or eight, I thought I wore a cape and I was invincible for the normal pains of mortal men. I was not afraid of bees. Yeah, you know what's coming, right? When my friends would scatter, I would appear. And all my glory, I meant glory, I meant gory. <laughs> and I remember being in the backyard of my friends, and there was a stump that was there. And they saw the bees, and they ran away. But I would conquer. So I went up and stood on that stump, and because of my quick athletic ability, snatched a bee from the air. And then I got a big surprise. I have not, at that point, felt pain like that. 
as the bee, the bee did not appreciate my glory and decided to add his part to my story and stung my hand really bad. And I ran like the rest of mortals as my hand turned five colors of blue and purple. And I cried and I cried. My mom, bless her heart, pulled the stinger out and I learned a lesson that bees sting. And when they sting, it hurts to be wary of the bee. Now, death indeed has a sting to it, does it not? When those we love die, be it anticipated or be it suddenly, there's a sting. And we are wounded and it is painful. And we grieve and we wail and we cry and we hurt. But that's not the end of the story. It seems like death will win forever. But because of the resurrection, that great getting up morning, where, oh death, is your sting now? Where, O oh death, is your victory? Because it will be no more. Because of the resurrection. And what was quoted here by Paul was prophesied hundreds of years before. And the Old Testament anticipates what is to be new and prepares us for the Messiah. And by the Spirit of God, Isaiah prophesied this day in which, which was to come. And here's the passage that was recorded in this passage in the New Testament. It's Isaiah chapter 25. It says this, The Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich foods, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich foods, and the finest of meats of aged wine, well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering, the veil that is cast over all people, the veil that is spread over all nations. And he will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all Faces. Does this sound familiar to you from Revelation? Right? And the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and Rejoice in his salvation. That's good news, right? And the Holy Spirit empowered his prophets to point forward to that day. He says, hold on. This death that we experience will be overcome. Hold on. The veil that separates us from that place will be removed. But hold on. Death will be swallowed up in victory. For all nations. The day of salvation will come. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in that salvation. That is good news. Now, how many of you like to receive presents? Anyone like to receive presents? No one wants to admit, yes, I like to receive presents, right? Presents are a gift given to us by someone else. It's something that is received. Now, I remember on Christmas that before Christmas, you know, my parents would put 
gifts under the tree. And as a young man, I greatly anticipated. And you go and you would look and I found some presents with my name on it, right? And I was so excited to get those presents and maybe it was just me, but sometimes I would grab them and shake them. Did any of you do that, right? Or look at them. And don't tell my wife this, but she used to go in and kind of slit the, slit the, the, uh, the thing and kind of look. Okay. And the present was given, perhaps like this present here. And salvation is like a present that is yet wrapped. Okay. We presently have it, but it's veiled. We don't know all of the details that are there, but we know a few things about it. Someday when Christ comes, this will be unveiled. And we already have salvation, but not in its fullness. Does that make sense? Okay. You and I have it now, but he's talking about on that day that salvation will be declared and the veil will be unwrapped and we'll see all of the glories of the gift that God has given us. And we will rejoice that day. So I want you to think about salvation in a way that it is a gift that has been given to us, that Christ purchased to us. And we have an ability to receive, and we have it already, but not quite yet, because it will be unwrapped and it will be revealed at the last time. This is what's being described here. And notice that it says, for all peoples and all nations. This was a news flash to those people in that day that thought because they were the sons and daughters physically of Abraham who had a covenant and a promise given to him that they only were going to receive this salvation. But even here impregnated throughout the Old Testament there was this glory for all the nations to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name, only for us in this building. No. For all the nations. This was in God's heart from the very beginning. And it points to he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death you won't be able to find death. I am looking forward to that day. In this world, we have tears. There is pain. We feel the sting of death. But it won't be forever. Let us be glad and rejoice in His salvation. It's not a salvation that we can come upon ourselves. It's not if we can earn our way to heaven. But in Christ, we will be saved. Those who believe in Him and are found in Him, this is the promise. Because of the resurrection... You and I will be changed. It's a promise guaranteed by Christ himself. Because of the resurrection, death will be defeated. Right? This is good news to us. Also, next point, because of the resurrection, Christ will be victorious. It goes on in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 as Paul is laying these things out for us. The sting of death is sin. And the power of death comes from the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory to our Lord Jesus Christ. 
So Paul was breaking this down a little bit, saying that death is a result of sin. And sin gains its power from the law. Now the book of Romans talks about this in great detail. Saying that because the law of God, the moral law of God, the Ten Commandments, we now have become aware of sin. Even from the garden where he says, you shall do this, you shall not do that. We knew that if we rebelled against God's standard, that we were sinners. And so in looking at the Ten Commandments and we measure ourselves against it, all have fallen short right, of the glory of God. Romans says that the wages of sin is death. Now, when Jesus came and when he preached, he magnified the law to even a greater degree. Any of you have a handheld mirror that you can look at yourself closely? And then some of those mirrors, you can turn them over. It's a magnifying mirror. Isn't that fun, right? You think you're okay, you turn it over, oh my. I didn't know these things were there on my face, right? (laughs) Christ magnified us and showed us the true depth of our sinfulness. When he preached the Sermon on the Mount, remember this? For those who thought, well, they're doing pretty good, they said, well, (laughs) I've not murdered anyone. Jesus said, well, have you ever been angry with anybody? You've murdered them in your heart. Well, those who said, I've never committed adultery. Have you ever lusted after someone? You've committed adultery. Jesus made it abundantly clear that all have fallen short. Knowing this fact, we cry out with the words of Paul, wretched person that I am, who will deliver me from this body Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You and I are not our own Redeemer. He comes to us. He gives us the victory. This is called imputed righteousness. You and I have fallen short, but Christ did not. And he, because he died in our place and resurrected, we can have new life in him. And he gives us the victory. There is no one like Christ. Right? There is no one who has been resurrected. There's been plenty who have come back from the dead, and there's a difference, right? Old Lazarus coming up out of the tomb, he died again, right? Jairus' daughter, who was raised to life, she died again. But not Jesus, right? When he came out of the tomb, he was resurrected, never to die again. And he gives us the victory. He gives us salvation. In him, we have victory. He gives us his righteousness, and in him we have life over death. Salvation can only be received as a gift, and it cannot be earned. Say amen to that, right? If you're trying to earn your way to heaven, you cannot. No matter how good you are, you're not God good, right? 
You're not perfect, good. But Christ is and was, and in Him we can receive the good gift that He has given us. Because of the resurrection, you will be changed. Because of the resurrection, death will be defeated. Because of the resurrection, Christ is victorious. The resurrection matters, and it gives us hope. And because of the resurrection, your faith will be rewarded. Now Paul, pouring out through the Holy Spirit in the whole chapter 15, and we did not go through all of it, talks about what Christ did, talks about what it means, talks about what's going to happen. And then in the very end, he tells us these words, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. In light of the resurrection, in light of what we have in Christ, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Now that we know all this, Stand in the truth of it. Do not be moved off your mark. Do not let trials that come to you move you from your faith. Or riches that come to you move you from your faith. Or fame, or famine, or pain. Let not any philosophy or argument, nor difficulty, nor hardship stand firm. Don't let anything or anyone move you. There are plenty of people and plenty of things on this planet that are going to try to knock you off your mark. To try to move you from this belief of the truth that has been represented in the gospel. Don't let anything or anyone move you. What a stand on the faith we now profess. Like countless Christians who have stood firm on the truth of the gospel. I'm reminded of a story of a Young Martin Luther. Now, Martin Luther lived in the 1500s. And the church at that time had become deeply and darkly corrupted. He was trying to earn his way to God. He became a priest in the Roman church and felt the weight of his sin, and never felt like he did enough to earn acceptance in the heaven. He learned the ancient languages, and he started to read the Bible for himself. And in his study... His eyes were opened that that it is through Christ and, and faith in him alone that we are saved. This was a revolution to him. And he was born again, knowing what Scripture taught and knowing what Christ did. And he wrote and he wrote and he wrote. And he pounded on the door of a cathedral. This is what comes to be known as the 95 Theses. Remember this? And he was persecuted. And he was put to a trial in front of the magistrates, in front of the um, religious council that's called the Council of Worms. And he was there, and they put all of his writings and his books in front of him. And they said, Do you recant what you wrote? And he says, 
give me a day. And he went away. And in earnest prayer, he came back the next day. And he told this on fear, the, 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 the group there, in fear of his losing his life. You can't convince me of scripture other than what I wrote. I will not change. Here I stand. I can do no other. I want you to have the same conviction. Here I stand. I can do no other. Here I stand when your co-workers wonder about your being a Christian. Here I stand. Here I stand when your family comes against you and saying, how can you believe those things? Here I stand. Here I stand when we face opposition. Here we stand when we face difficulty. Here we stand when the woos of the world and its wealth and its riches try to pull us away. Here we stand. We can do no other so Paul tells us, knowing the truth of the resurrection, dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. No person, no philosophy, no thing. And he goes on with this encouragement. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. Because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. That's good news. Often when people die and they pass with lots of money, they donate it to institutions, they donate it to universities, and they say they build a building and they want their name to be on it, right? You can look around town and you'll see buildings with people's names on it. Why do they do that? Because they want to be remembered. Right? Have you ever wondered what in this life is going to matter in eternity? Have you ever felt like what you're doing doesn't matter at all? Paul instructs us saying, because of the reality of eternity and of the resurrection, stand firm and give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. Why? Because you know that your labor in the Lord will count for something. If you want your life to count, give yourself to the work of the Lord. I can't imagine being in eternity and wishing I watched another movie, right? Or thinking, man, I wish I wouldn't have given that much money to missions. The best advice the Holy Spirit through the Pentapol can give us in light of eternity, it says, give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. That counts. That will matter. Everything else is going to get burned up, right? But what we do in the work and the service of the Lord is not in vain. That should encourage us. Knowing these things, it has motivated people to leave riches, to give up comforts and to go into places to bring the gospel knowing that they were living not for this day but for that day and inspired people like Jim Elliot who said he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose all of the stuff that is here and now you can't keep it I've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul. Right? That might be the only thing you remember. Okay. 
Never seen it. You can't take it with you. So in that knowledge, then what matters? <laughs> Give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. <laughs> he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And there have been other people throughout history. A guy like Charles Studd. Don't you like that last name? Charles. Who used his fortune and fame to start a mission movement in China and in India and Africa. He wrote many things, but this is one of the things that he wrote. He says, some want to live within the sound of church or chapel, chapel bell. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. Come on, Charles. Charles did just that. Grew up in a wealthy family. Was a great athlete, a cricket player. Gave it all up because he understood what matters most. And he went to China. He went to India. He went to Africa. And he wrote a very famous poem. I'm not going to read the whole poem for us. But I remember this stanza. I remember my grandmother who lived by the river, who had an old stove that she heated by wood, like a cooking stove. Any of you remember these things? My grandma had. A simple woman had an eighth grade education, ten children. Two of them died. She actually had 12. Two of them died in labor. This was my grandmother, my mom's mom. And she used to sing. And she prayed for all of her grandchildren every day by name. She said my name over and over when I was far from Christ. She had a little plaque on her window where she did her dishes, and I remember it. And it's from a poem that Charles Studd wrote. The last lines of this poem is this. Only one life, yes, only one. Now let me say, thy will be done. And when at last I'll hear the call, I know I'll say, "Twas worth it all. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. That's the lines. I remember seeing that, I remember thinking about it, and the reality of that line is here with us. So this morning, I want you to be encouraged. I want you to have hope. Because the tomb was empty, because of the resurrection, you will be changed. Because of the resurrection, death will be defeated. Because of the resurrection, Christ will be victorious, and because of the resurrection, your faith will be rewarded. Rejoice in the great hope we have been given. Rejoice in the grace that has been extended. Rejoice that there is a future in the love of the Lord. Rejoice that God has given us the grace to join with Him in what He is doing. And I want to encourage you to receive the gift of new life today. I want to encourage you to recommit yourself fully today. Today is a new time. It is a spring time. And I want us to rejoice and then consider anticipation of what is yet to come that is assured by who Jesus is and what he's promised to us. 
And then I want you to consider now how are we to yet live our life. Because of this grace that has been extended, because of the love that has been given, because of the invitation that we have received. Give yourself to what God is doing. Give yourself fully to the Lord. Ask God, what are you doing? How can I partner with you? Say, I'm all in because of what you have done for me. So God, here we are this day, and you are here among us. We are celebrating today in our Easter colors what you did. On this side of the veil, we are prisoners of hope. And God, I ask that today that we would say yes and put our trust in you. That you would make us anew. You would give us your life. You would transform us into your image. And God, I ask that we would live in your grace to walk and to follow after you. Empower us by your love to choose you, to choose wisely, and to choose to follow after you. God, may our hearts feel your resurrection power. May our homes experience your resurrection glory. May Rockford and the regions beyond see a great hope in the eyes of Jesus. May the nations be glad because death no longer is victorious because of the good news of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We thank you, God, for your goodness to us this day. May you be praised for all time and eternity until we see you face to face until we hear the last trumpet. We anticipate as prisoners of hope. Glorify yourself in our lives and these bodies. In Jesus' name, amen.